The title of my message, as most of you have read, has been the rad- or is the radical religion of Jesus Christ. And I uh, got this thought three years ago, uh, and uh, I've been carrying it ever since. And uh, I tried to come up with some other uh, subject, but it just wouldn't, this one wouldn't go away. And so we're going to try to bring that this morning. One of the things that motivated, I guess, the, the line of thought down this uh, uh, lesson is that I'd heard Rosie O'Donnell, most of you probably know who Rosie O'Donnell is, she was making a statement regarding her marriage to a same-sex partner. And what she said was that society has far more to fear from radical Christianity than from gays, lesbians, and same-sex marriage. And the thought struck me, does she even understand what Christianity is? How could anybody think that Christianity could bring fear to anyone? How could the religion of Jesus Christ ever bring anything to anyone but peace? Oh yes, it may stir some things up, but it won't be by the Christians. It'll be by those whose hearts are not right. Uh, And so uh, I thought I've just got to say something about that because indeed, uh, if you look up the word radical, uh, that does apply to us. Uh, And let me give you the definition for that. First of all, the objective of my my lesson is to show that radical teaching can be either good or bad, but they are easily distinguishable by the actions that accompany them. And that's important for us to understand because I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus was a radical in the environment in which that he lived. So let me give you uh, the definition uh, of uh, of radical uh, as it's listed in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. And it says, pertaining to the root or origin, original, primitive, fundamental, as in a fundamental truth or error. Now that's what uh, Christianity is. It is fundamental. It is the root. uh, And and it is the beginning uh, of the uh, the, uh, peace that Jesus intended to bring to the whole earth. But he had to bring that peace in an environment of violence. And that's the thing that I want you to understand as we go through this lesson. That violence is the evidence of corruption. And we live in a society that's violent. Man might think that he is working himself toward a peaceful kingdom, but it's not going to happen as long as sin is in this world uh, because sin is, is, is at the root of that fundamental error which the actions uh, result in violence. And I'm going to prove that uh, if the Lord will help me before this lesson is over. Uh, And so that's what Webster said about radical uh, in 1828. But if you look up the modern definition of radical, here's what it says. As used in common language, it's marked by a considerable departure from the traditional tending or disposed to make extreme changes in existing views, habits, conditions, and institutions. And believe it or not, both of those definitions are true. Uh, And the problem is that Christianity, as it's known or as it's thought of, has drifted so far away from its original point that when people look at it today, when you try to get back to the fundamentals, you're labeled as a radical diverging from the modern tendencies and thought of the society in which that we live. And so that is true. Uh, radical Christianity, which is fundamental Christianity, is far different than what is purported to be Christianity. If you go out and take a poll today in America, you'll find somewhere around 70 to 72 percent of the population will identify as Christians. Uh, And the rest identify primarily with some other type of uh, of religion. Most religions try to propose peace. Only a very small portion uh, of our population are actually uh, atheists and believe in no God. Uh, And so my question is, if we are a Christian society, why is there so much violence around it? Why is it that I'm afraid to go down to Nashville at night uh, because of the violence that's on the street? Uh, And yet what I see 
is that when I see these things on television uh, and the riots that we've had and uh, all the uprisings, I see many people out there with these big crosses around their necks or tattooed on their arms and, uh, and yet they're out promoting violence and I know immediately they're not Christian. They can say what they want, uh, but they are not purporting to the things that Jesus purported to uh, and laid down as fundamentals uh, while that he was here. And so uh, that's where our lesson is going to try to go today, is to bring out and show the difference between the radical, which leads into violence, and the radical, uh, which leads into peace. Now, in order to do that, I've got to give you some more definitions. Uh, I'm like uh, Brother Compton. I like books. I like to, to look up details. I try to understand those things. And just like that word radical, if we don't sort it out uh, and we just go with the popular view of what the word radical means, we'll miss uh, that Christianity is fundamentally truth. And it's fundamentally peace not to bring an uprising. Now that Jesus told his disciples uh, that uh, certainly that when they went out into the world to take the gospel out, he said, I'm sending you out as sheep among the wolves. Uh, and, but what did he tell us to be? He told us to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Now, folks, we live in the society uh, of America and this world where that everything moment by moment is before us on television and, uh, and we, we know everything is going on in time. And we can see violence everywhere. Uh, and so we have to live in this world. It's wonderful when we can come here to the minister school and uh, we can enjoy the fellowship of one with another and we have that, that same spirit and feel that love toward one another. But that's not what you're going to when you leave here and go out into the world. Uh, you're going to be fortunate if you have a small group in a little church somewhere that have a like spirit as you. Uh, and when you go to work, when you go to the stores, when you go down into the, uh, to the uh, uh, various places in society, you're going to meet a lot of people who will say they're Christians. Uh, but again, what are the actions showing? What are the actions showing? I've got to give you some definitions, and uh, I'm going to pick up a passage that may be controversial. Uh, I've done that before, and, uh, and, and the passage that I'm going to choose for a background may be a little controversial in my interpretation, but I think if you'll study it out, you'll see I'm right. Uh, and <laughs> We'll see. But let me give you some definitions. You already know these definitions, but I can guarantee you the world does not. They won't see it through the same eyes that we have been taught. It's because you see the things uh, the, and the way that we practice, for most of us, it's not uh, unusual. It's not out of the norm, but it is to the rest of the world. Those of us who were brought up around uh, uh, Baptist churches and in missionary Baptist churches, we've seen people get down and pray together. We've seen people shout. Uh, we've been in, in those kind of services, but that's foreign to the rest of the world. And they think we're crazy, most of them. But in reality, we know that that's the, the true root of what Christianity is. Let me give you these definitions. First definition I'd like to give you is the family of God. Uh, Brother Lewis read this passage last night about the family of God in Ephesians. Uh, but let me, let me give you that definition. The family of God includes all of the children of God in heaven and on earth. Ephesians 3.15, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Uh, how do you get into a family? You're born into that family, and we know that it's a born-again experience. But the family includes all believers. Ye are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So all believers are in the family of God, uh, whether they're over in Kosovo or Ukraine. And folks, I've been privileged to travel around the world, and I've, I've met people in, in many different cultures but it doesn't take very long to identify a similar spirit, even though the language might be a barrier. Uh, and just as uh, Brother Monty went down to Belize and he found people there who were believers. I found people in Australia who were believers. I found people in China 
who were believers. I was in Amsterdam once and uh, another a friend of mine and, uh, uh, and I had gone to a restaurant uh, and while we was in the restaurant, there was a couple, young couple over there uh, and they were asking a blessing on their meal uh, as they prepared to eat. And I looked at Dave Powell and I said, Dave, those people must be Christians. And we went over and introduced ourselves, had a wonderful fellowship with them. They were from somewhere down in South America, but they loved the same Lord I love. Uh, and I felt that kindred spirit as we talked. And so uh, the family of God uh, is all of those uh, who are children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Since the Old Testament, saints were saved by faith in Christ. They're all members of God's family. When a man is born again, he is born into the family of God. He is in the family of God forever. The relationship never changes, whether in heaven or in earth. We are in the family of God. Now, let's take that a little bit further uh, and let's uh, identify the kingdom of heaven because we're going to talk a little bit about that. See, what, that's what Jesus found when he got here. That's why he was considered a radical because the popular view of what the kingdom of heaven was was something different than what Jesus tried to teach them and to show them. And we'll get into that in a moment, but let me identify it. You may not agree with my identification of it, uh, and that's okay. I would refer you to Brother Moran's uh, book on, uh, on Baptist uh, practices, chapter 11, I believe it was. And I didn't look that up until after I'd already written this out, by the way. So I didn't steal it, but I was sure happy when I read it and found out it was the same thing I believed. The <laughs> kingdom of heaven includes all the saved on earth at any given time. Uh, the kingdom is said to be composed of all born again on the earth. What is sometimes called the spiritual kingdom is composed of only of those who have been born again, who have been translated out of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. When a man is born again, he also enters the kingdom of heaven. Uh, that's what Jesus told Nicodemus, uh, that uh, you must be born again or you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus was alive in this life uh, and walking on earth just like we are. And you're going to see the distinction here. And uh, we all believe this, but whether or not you've made this, uh, this distinction in your mind, I don't know. I hope particularly for young preachers that you'll get this sorted out in your mind because you're going to have to identify that uh, somewhat as you uh, go in your preaching and teaching. When a, man, when a man dies, he passes out of the kingdom of God on earth and the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven as used in the scriptures are, are uh, the same thing. A lot of people like to make a distinction between the two, but uh, you'll find that the, the term kingdom of heaven is used in Matthew. Kingdom of God is used in, in, in other uh, gospels. And so they're interchangeable. They mean the same thing. It means the earthly place where God reigns uh, in the, uh, on earth. And we'll identify that a little closer. When he dies, he passes out of the kingdom of God on earth and enters into his heavenly kingdom. Second Timothy 4.18, uh, Paul says, And the Lord shall deliver me from evil, every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, and so the scriptures teach us that when we've been preserved through this, we'll be translated into that heavenly kingdom. It's basically the same thing that Paul said in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Let me read those verses uh, because what I want you to understand is when time ends, and it will end, when time ends, the kingdom of heaven on earth will be united with the heavenly kingdom of the Father for eternity. For eternity. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 chapter beginning about the 22nd verse. For then Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Then about every man in his own time. Christ the first fruit, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. When is he coming again? He's coming at the end. It says then cometh the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God to the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign 
till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, death has been conquered, uh, but we are still subject to it in this environment. And the Lord has not returned yet. Uh, and so we know that there is an end coming. And when he comes, that he will have destroyed death. That's why I believe in a general judgment and a general resurrection. I'm not one of these who believes that there's going to be a taking away of the, uh, of the saints while the, uh, the rest of the people are left here. You're gonna, if you haven't met that yet, out in your ministry, you will. Uh, and you're going to need to understand and have some basis here in, in order to not argue with those people, but to try to persuade them of the error of their ways and some of their thinking. That's not where I want to go, but uh, I just wanted to say that. Uh, but, but there will come an end. And when uh, the Lord uh, comes back, and destroys death, he will deliver this kingdom unto the Father and they will be united together for one kingdom of heaven for eternity. I believe that. I believe that. Now, let me give you uh, uh, one more definition and that is the word church. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but we make a distinction. I, when I teach, and I've taught history of the uh, church uh, a number of times, I'm in the process of teaching it right now at Hillsdale, uh, but I would start out by making the distinction uh, between the family of God, the kingdom of heaven, and the church, because they're not the same, uh, and yet uh, there is a progression and something we need to understand. The Greek word ecclesia, rendered church, is derived from a word meaning called out and is used to indicate a company called out from a larger and more general assembly of people. In the free Greek cities, it designated a company of persons possessed of the rights of citizenship. Now, that's important. Possessed of the rights of citizenship because when they called out the ecclesia, it was called out from among the citizens. Uh, and further, they were charged with certain important functions of the administration in public affairs. They were summoned or called out from the general mass of the people. In the New Testament, the ecclesia is a company of persons called out and separate from the general citizenry uh, and invested with certain privileges and responsibilities while being charged with the duty specific to advancing the kingdom of Christ. Now, that's my definition. Uh, I've been using it for a number of years. Uh, and, and folks, I believe there are people out there that are saved, uh, that they have been uh, regenerated. They're in the family of God. And I believe that their hearts are such that they uh, are, are subject to, to, to the Lord Jesus Christ on this earth. Uh, and that's why I can have fellowship with them but they're not necessarily in the Lord's church uh, because the church is composed of those called out from that general mass of citizens in the kingdom of God uh, to be united together to administer the affairs uh, of the kingdom. And folks, that's an important distinction. Let me make you one other part of that definition. After a man has been born again, he is not in a church of God, but is now a scriptural subject for admission into that church. That's a radical view compared to the rest of the world. That's not what they think. They think that a person is uh, born again into this universal, invisible church. That's what you're going to meet out there. You're going to have to be able uh, to make some reason with them and help them to understand that. Otherwise, they will continue on in their fundamental error. Uh, and so you need to familiarize yourself with these definitions. And, uh, and not simply because that I gave a definition or you read it. It's got to become a part of who you are uh, and the theology which you possess in your heart. Uh, I was laughing last night telling my wife, Brother Spurgeon talked about uh, using e-sword. I love e-sword. And I use all kinds of commentaries, but I don't get my theology from from them. I get my culture. I get my uh, what was going on at the time of Jesus. I get my history from them. I try to familiarize myself with the times like brother, uh, like uh, 
the, the brother did yesterday when he was talking about the, uh, the bride of Christ. He had wonderful, rich stuff in there, but he didn't get that out of the Bible. He got it out of other extra materials to help him understand that. Use those things for that purpose, but know your theology before that you try to get those things uh, from there. Church membership, the Lord added to the church daily those that were saved, Acts 2.47. Church membership was not something a man got with salvation, but was and is a subsequent blessing received after salvation by being added to one of the Lord's churches. Baptism is not essential to admission into either the family of God or the kingdom of God, but is essential to the admission into the church of Jesus Christ. Folks, that's different than what the rest of the world, it wasn't different to start with. It was originally fundamentally what was taught. Uh, and that's exactly the way that the church was organized. That's exactly the way the church at Jerusalem uh, grew uh, and expanded and broke uh, into pieces uh, and filled the whole earth, which we'll get to in just a moment. So those basic fundamental definitions are important. Otherwise, you'll be easily taken down the same road as Rosie McDonald or, or O'Donnell, thinking that, that a, 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 a going back to our roots is a radical, uh, a, a, a radical action. It is, might be radical for the rest of the world, but that's where they need to get to. They need to get back to the roots of Christianity, what, not what people today are thinking Christianity is. And the distinction is easily seen by the actions of the people who claim to be Christians. Let's go a little bit further. I want to read my, wow, I'm going to run out of time. I knew I spent too much, but I've been three years trying to get this ready. I'm going, to, I'm going to get into a scripture that I think is important. It's important for me, and I hope it is for, for you too. Because you want to remember that Jesus came into this world, and as he did so, he was meeting ideas uh, and thoughts in the environment that he was in that he had to change. Much of his teaching uh, was to change those ideas. Yes, he did preaching, but he did a whole lot of teaching because people needed to be taught. So if you'll bear with me as I, I read this passage, it's a little bit lengthy, but it's important because then I want to come back and talk a little bit about it. In Matthew, in the 11th chapter, uh, about the first 19 verses, you'll be familiar with it. Uh, it says, and it came to pass when Jesus had made an ending of commanding his 12 disciples, I believe that was up on the mountaintop there, uh, Brother Curtis, uh, after he had charged his 12 disciples, sent them out into the world uh, and told them, at, as I said, uh, to be uh, like sheep among the wolves. Uh, and he said, you're going to face persecution. You're going to face violence. Uh, and when you face that violence, uh, he said, just go to another city. He didn't tell them to fight back. He didn't tell them to get a sword. Didn't tell them to try to, to go in there and try to force people to be Christians. But he warned them, you're going to meet people out there who are going to resist what you have to say. And it's going to cause violence, but not by you but to you. Uh, and, and it's inevitable because of the sinful nature of man. Let me go on. Now, when Jesus had heard, uh, or when John had heard in the prison, the work of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, art thou he that should come or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said unto them, go and show John again those things which you do see and hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitude concerning John, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? But what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft raiment, clothing, are in the king's house. But what went you out to see? A prophet? Yeah, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of woman, there hath not risen one greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that in, is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That verse there always did kind of throw me off a little bit early on, but Brother Reynolds helped me to understand that. Uh, and I believe I have a right understanding about that. I'll get into it in just a moment. Uh, but it, and then it says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence 
and the violent take it by force. Now, embed that verse in your mind here for just a moment. We're going to come back to it. Uh, and I'm going to have a radical view of that verse. I, I probably radical compared to every one of the commentaries that you'll pick up and read. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. Violence take it by force. For all the prophets and the laws prophesied until John. And, you, and if you will receive it, this is Elias or Elijah, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Where, but whereunto shall I liken this generation? Like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, we've piped unto you and you have not danced. We've mourned unto you and you've not lamented. For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he hath a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber and a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified uh, of her children. Now, the theme of this whole chapter, and I'm not going to read all the chapter, but the theme of this whole chapter uh, is to validate certain truths but also to correct some error in their thinking. Now, Jesus was not bashful when it comes to reproving people of wrong thinking. Uh, and so when you look at this chapter, uh, you have to recognize that the biggest part of this chapter is reproof uh, for them not receiving the truth uh, and being thinking incorrectly about things. Uh, so we see that in the first uh, two to, verses 2 to 6, that the first thing Jesus does is he validates himself to John, whose disciples had come to him, and to the people, and let them know that, yes, indeed, I am the one that's to come, and the evidence is in the miracles. The evidence is in the sight that's given to the blind, the dead that are raised, the lame that are walked. Uh, and so it wasn't just his words, but it was his actions and the evidence of it. Was any of those things bad? Was any of those things bad? Were they not good? Jesus had to have that argument with the Pharisees one time about healing a man on the Sabbath. And he tried to explain to them, you got this thing all out of proportion. Uh, it's always right to do good. It's always right to do good. Uh, and so he validates himself uh, uh, through, the, through his action. Then... He validates John to the people in the seventh and the ninth verses, uh, and he rebukes them for their confused expectations of John. What did you go out to see? A reed shaken in the wind? Or, or do you think he was going to be dressed up like a king? Uh, and so they were confused uh, because he wasn't exactly what they expected. Uh, and so again, he's rebuking them uh, for their wrong thoughts about John because he didn't meet their expectation, their earthly expectations. Uh, and so uh, that's about the first nine verses. But in that 10th verse, he says, for this is he of whom, of whom is written, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Jesus begins at that point to turn their attention from himself and from John, but to turn them toward the message that John and he have both been preaching. And what is that message? The message is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's no longer prophesied to come. It's no longer something to look forward to, but it is here right now. Uh, and so uh, that tells us that, he, that he's rebuking them for wrong thoughts about that, what that kingdom was. And so he begins to turn their minds toward that. He uses the word of God to validate it uh, because he goes back to Malachi uh, and he picks up the uh, uh, first verse of the third chapter and says, behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And so he said, yep, yep. The kingdom is at hand, just like Malachi prophesied. And John come be uh, heralding it, just like it was prophesied uh, to come. You just don't understand what he's trying to tell you because you have your mind formed in a wrong thought and in a wrong direction. Then in verse 11, he says, Verily I say unto you, 
among them that are born of woman, there hath not risen one greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, Jesus is making a pretty radical statement, uh, and he intended to pave the way for an even more radical statement in the next verse. Uh, but what he wants them to understand was there was an earthly kingdom uh, that was made up of earthly people. Uh, and John was among those great men like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and many of the others. And they were giants in the flesh uh, in that earthly kingdom. But the kingdom that he came to preach, the kingdom of heaven, which is a spiritual kingdom, which is entered into by a new birth, uh, that he is the lowest or the least in it, is greater than any that's in any earthly kingdom. And he wanted them to understand that. And that's how that he makes that statement that he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John uh, in the earthly kingdom of Israel. That's important, the earthly kingdom of Israel, because that's where their minds were, uh, and they missed the spiritual part, because what were they looking for? They was looking for an earthly kingdom to be reestablished. Re and so what the people thought uh, what the kingdom was going to be, and what the prophets and the law were teaching that it was going to be, were radically different. They were different and opposed, different than one another. And Jesus had to bring their thinking back into alignment with what the prophecies were. So let's go to that 12th verse. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Jesus now completely is turning their thinking. And I've struggled with this verse, and I've struggled with it. And every, every place that I look up, I tell you what, the, I'm going to give you an example of one commentary, but I, you can look up 25 commentaries, and they'll all pretty much give you the same, uh, the same, uh, 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 the same, the same thing that the, ver that the verse says uh, is what they would say. Let me tell you what Adam Clark said. Adam Clark said with regard to that verse, he that will take, that is get possession of the kingdom of righteousness, peace, and spiritual joy must be in earnest. All hell will oppose him in every step he takes. And if a man be not absolutely determined to give up his sins and evil companions, and have his soul saved at all hazards and at every expense, he will surely perish everlasting. This requires a violent earnestness. Now, I agree with that statement. I do agree with that statement. A man's got to want it more than anything in the world, but I don't believe that's what Jesus is telling them in this verse because it's out of place. It doesn't fit with the context of the rebuke that he's giving them. Uh, and he was facing something. What he was facing was the, the, what they thought the kingdom was and what they were trying to establish. And he said men are trying to establish this kingdom by violence and take it by force. They even took him on one occasion uh, and tried to make him king and he had to, uh, to, to evade them. But he knew what they thought. He knew what they wanted. They, were, they wanted to be, uh, have the boundaries reestablished uh, and then expanded to include all the other nations, but it, they wanted it to be an earthly kingdom in which the Messiah reigned uh, and they had the rule. Even the disciples thought that because they were arguing over who was going to sit at his right hand and who was going to sit at his left hand. So there was total confusion about what this kingdom of heaven was uh, that uh, Daniel had prophesied about and the law and the prophets were looking to. So let's see if we can make the distinction between what the prophet said and what the kingdom really was. Let's go back to Daniel. You all know the story. I'm not going to spend much time on uh, the, the interpretation that Daniel gave to Nebuchadnezzar uh, of the statue that he saw or the idol that had the head of gold and the shoulders of silver and the torso of, 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 of brass and the legs of iron. Uh, and here's what Daniel said when he interpreted that dream to him uh, in the, the 24th verse of the second chapter. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to others, but it shall break in pieces and consume all of these other kingdoms and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king 
what shall come to pass hereafter, and this dream is certain, uh, and the interpretation thereof. And so Daniel prophesied the kingdom is coming. The kingdom is coming, and it's going to come at the end of the days of these kings. And what did John the Baptist do? The first time he went out to preach, he said, Be, uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. It's here, it's now uh, here among us. And he preached that, and Jesus preached that. But that's not what the people was expecting it to be. They was expecting it to be an earthly kingdom. They thought uh, that that's what it would be. And so uh, that's uh, the idea that they had. Now, Jesus had to dispel that idea. That's why we go back to that 12th verse. Uh, and I believe that, it's, uh, that he is still rebuking them. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I can look things up, uh, and you can too. Fortunately, people have recorded things for us. Uh, but as I look, began to search that out and try to understand that verse, because it's the only place that I can find that something seems to be out of context when Jesus talks about taking the kingdom by violence and the, uh, and the violent uh, have done so, or that the kingdom suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Uh, the interpretation about the way in which that we're saved is it's true, but it just doesn't fit in this passage because of the rebuke that Jesus is giving them for the wrong thinking. So the Greek verb used here and translated suffereth violence is used only here and in Luke 16, 16. Now that's important uh, where it is translated presseth. And Jesus said that until the, uh, that the law and the prophets were until John. Uh, and since then, every man presseth into it. Same verb, same verb uh, that's translated violent. Now, you might be able to think that, well, he is talking about the difficulty of getting into the kingdom, except you have to put it into context of who he was talking to. Who was he talking to? He was talking to the Pharisees. He was talking to the men who had resisted him, to the men who had stirred up uh, the, the crowds against him. He was talking up to the men who were resisting the very things that he had tried to teach. And in the verse just before that, in the 15th verse of the 16th chapter, he said to those Pharisees, and he said unto them, the Pharisees, ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And then he gives the verse about the violent uh, uh, men pressing into it, using the violence to get into it. Uh, and certainly that's what these Pharisees uh, were doing. Uh, and uh, so uh, we can see that the, the two scriptures do go hand in hand when you consider the audience that he's talking to and what he's trying to get, convey to them. Now, all, the other thing is that in the 12th verse there in Matthew, he says, and the violent take it by force. Now, that word violent uh, is a noun, and it's used only here. It's the only place uh, in the New Testament that it's used, uh, and it unquestionably means those who practice violence. It unquestionably means that. Uh, and so every other translation, if you've got one of those e-swords, it's got all of those translations on them, look at every one of them and every one of them will translate it that way. Let me give you an example simply uh, of the Amplified Version, which it says, and violent men seize it by force. Uh, and so it's exactly what Jesus said. Men whose hearts are not right are trying to take the kingdom of peace uh, and make it what they want because they want to be in charge of it. They want to run it. Uh, they want to be uh, the, the leaders of it. Uh, and so he's rebuking them for that. Now, that, was, uh, that really persuaded me pretty much that, uh, that I understood that verse right. Uh, but then I got to looking a little bit deeper. And I went over into the book of Luke and Luke uh, reiterates that whole uh, experience, that whole conversation in the seventh chapter of Luke. You can go read it almost word for word. It's almost like he copied and pasted it uh, from Matthew over into his gospel. Word for word, all the way down through, except he left out the 12th verse. He didn't put that verse in there about violent, taking it by force. But what did he put in? What did he put in? Let's read it. 29th verse of Luke, and I'm just going to pick up where the, he inserted something. He said, and all the people that heard him, that is John, and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John, but the Pharisees and lawyers 
rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of John. Luke was at a perspective where that he could see what Jesus meant. Who was responsible for stirring up the people? Who was responsible for trying to get Jesus killed uh, so that, uh, that the people wouldn't follow him? Who was responsible for every trouble that he ran into? It wasn't the Gentiles. It was those unlearned uh, Jews that Jesus said to them, you are of your father the devil. And how did he... How did he identify the devil? He said the devil was a murderer from the beginning. He identifies him as violent and the product of him, the children from him, they're, they're going to get what they want by violence. They're going to try to take it uh, and they're going to try to make it what they want uh, and then they're going to blame it, uh, blame it on the peace lovers and those who are trying to do things the way that the Lord wanted them to do. It was true then. It's true now, and that's what you're going to face uh, as you go out into the world. And so I've got, to, uh, uh, I've got to move on. I'm way out of time. But you have to read the rest of the chapter. He goes down through that chapter in the seventh chapter of, or 11th chapter of Matthew, and he rebukes the cities for not hearing the message. He rebukes them for not repenting, and, and he rebukes them for all of these things. So it's a chapter of rebuke against the people. But then when he gets right down to the bottom of the chapter, then he tells him how you do enter into the kingdom. And it's not by violence. It's not by force. It's not by having to fight anybody out of the way because he's not trying to keep you out of the kingdom. He wants you in the kingdom. And so what does he say uh, down in the uh, 28th through the 30th verse of that chapter? He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yeah. What does the world have to fear from that? What does the world have to fear from that? The reason that they fear is because they reject uh, the, the Messiah uh, and the fact that it's a spiritual kingdom that they will enter into uh, and, that, uh, and that they will not have an earthly kingdom, uh, but it will be a spiritual kingdom. Now, there is an earthly people. He's always been represented by an earthly people. In the Old Testament, uh, the kingdom of heaven was Israel. They had borders around them. He was their king. You could see them. They were a physical people, uh, and most of them dwelt within those borders. Uh, but there were a few citizens of Israel that might dwell somewhere else, just like we have those who are uh, uh, subjects of the king in the kingdom that might not dwell within the borders of the visible people of the church, but they're still citizens of that kingdom. Uh, and our job as the church is to teach them. Uh, and I can tell you, having gone on to the mission field, and those of you who have uh, as well, you'll find yourself doing exactly the same thing that the Apostle Paul did. Uh, and that is you'll go, first of all, to the people who have some knowledge, who have some acquaintance with God. Uh, Paul always went into the synagogues first, and there uh, he began to teach them uh, and to, uh, to erase their error and to replace that error with truth. That's where we begin. Uh, that's where I started in West Virginia, I think that's where Brother Reynolds, uh, what he found was some people there who had been saved. Uh, and, and so the Lord's arm's not short. He saved people all over the world and then he sends us out to help teach them, instruct them uh, that others might be saved and brought in. Uh, but if all you're wanting is the earthly glory and the earthly kingdom, uh, then uh, you're looking for the wrong thing. Uh, you're looking for the wrong thing. I'm, I'm clear out of time. But I want you to just reflect for the last couple of minutes that I have on the fact that I said that, that Christianity and, and serving the Lord is radical compared to the society in which that you live. Not radical in the sight of God, but radical to the society in which you live. Noah built a boat when it had never rained. And people were out there saying, what is this crazy guy doing? That's a pretty radical action to go out there uh, and build a boat when they had never seen a flood, no doubt, concerning what we uh, understand about the scriptures. And so he was somewhat radical. They probably mocked him. I don't know whether they threw stones at him or, or brought any violence on him, but certainly they thought he was a little off. 
Uh, and then we could go down through and we could find Abraham. We can find Abraham who was a monotheist. He lived in a society where they had many gods. But this crazy guy believed in one God. Uh, and I don't know that he went out and tried to use a whip to whip anybody else to believe in the one God. But his belief in the one God led him in the path that God wanted to take him in. And so as far as the people was concerned, Abraham was a little bit crazy uh, to get up, uh, take all of his belongings and get on his camels and head out there into the wilderness, knowing not where he was going. And I can tell you, just like uh, when Brother Monty went down to Belize, when I went to Australia, when, uh, when Brother Jones went to Jamaica and uh, others have gone to Africa, you don't know what you're going to find, uh, but you're determined to follow him uh, and the people are going to think you're crazy. My in-laws thought that I was crazy for taking their daughter to the other side of the world. But I tell you what, God blessed us. God blessed us. He blessed our children. He's blessing our grandchildren. If you'll follow the Lord wherever he leads you, the world will think you're crazy. But God will be satisfied. God will be pleased. And my time is up. And I didn't even get a third. I didn't even get half through this lesson. Uh, but I, I hope that you'll take the notes. Follow it through, but at the conclusion of it, at the conclusion of it, uh, I, and I want you to, uh, to uh, get this conclusion because it's important. It's important for the time that we live in and who we are. It would be great if we could just live inside of this church uh, with our brothers and our sisters. Some people tried that during the times that the monks went up on the hills and lived up in the trees or on the mountains or whatever. But we have to be out in the world because that's where the world needs. The world needs Jesus and we're the ones that are to represent to them. But we have to remember who our king is. He is the prince of peace. Not violence, not violence in any way, shape or form. And if anything, uh, one uh, wants to lead you into violence or something wrong. Uh, let me give you one example. It just now popped into my mind as I looked over there to, to Brother Hicks, if you'll give me just a moment. Back in, the, I believe it was 1980, Brother Reynolds was debating uh, a man named uh, Larry Keenan. Was that right, Brother Reynolds, Larry Keenan? He was debating him, and I was at the debate, and uh, Brother Tim Binion, I don't know whether Tim's here or not, Tim was there, Brother Hicks was there. And the debate was over the work of the Spirit and knowing uh, your salvation by the work of the Spirit in your heart and knowing that you have the Holy Spirit. Well, we took a break, and I still smoked at that time. Brother Hicks smoked. and We went outside on the porch and we were standing out there and there was a bunch of guys out there from Larry Keenan's church and I heard one of them say to the other, well, when this thing's over, we'll take these boys out in the, in the street and we'll show them who's got the Holy Spirit. Now, there's something wrong. <laughs> there's something wrong with that attitude of violence. That happened. That happened. If Brother Tim was here, he could probably tell you. That's the attitude of people who really don't have that Holy Spirit in their heart because he can produce nothing but peace. And I'm going to close with this conclusion. If you will be a true follower of Christ, your actions will be val viewed as radical by the society in which that you live, but your life will be clearly marked by nonviolence, unquenchable thirst for truth, and a clear reflection of God's character, which is holy and peaceful and loving. That's what they'll see in true Christianity. And the rest of these, they're just trying to climb up the wall another way. I appreciate your time. Let me leave you with one thought about the truth. And I wish that I had been the one who thought of this, but I wasn't. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, Augustine maybe said this. But the thing that we have to learn about the truth is the truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Just turn it loose. It'll defend itself. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I appreciate your time.